But this scenario describes an alternate future whereby the year 2020, citizens and industry are demanding that their governments and intergovernmental organizations take center stage to clean up an internet that's become infected by dangerous content and criminal conduct. What are the drivers for this scenario? And anytime you come up with converging forces, it seems like we now use the meteorological metaphor of a perfect storm. And this is meant to show that between now and 2020, this perfect storm of drivers converged to make the scenario plausible, plausible enough to be a provocative discussion point. So the converging forces here where the consumers have just lost confidence in communications and e-commerce on the internet, too much phishing and fraud. Others that businesses can no longer afford the tremendous losses they have, not only from fraud, but from lawsuits as they're being held liable for the content and conduct of users and others that use their networks and publishing sites. And finally, that governments have successfully, at the same time all of this is happening, governments are showing some success at using electronic surveillance and monitoring to protect their citizens from disastrous terrorist attacks. So you converge those forces together and it leads to the scenario where people ask government to please come in and take charge. What does the end state look like in 2020? You read the scenario to get the details, but here's just a summary of it. That the governments have begun to cooperate more and more with each other to oversee online content and e-commerce. They require biometric identification to use the internet. And as the fourth bullet says, imagine an, an online user's license, like a driver's license, that you can only obtain if you pass an internet safety exam and survive a background check. And without this online license, biometrically authenticated to you, you can't even log on to, to look at email, to surf the web, or publish content. What about online publishers? Suppose courts have become incredibly activist, and online publishers are suddenly held liable for everything. Think about how that's going to crimp their ability to be creative. So that's the end state and the drivers. So what were the reactions that we had today? I should start by saying that it was an animated discussion from wire to wire for an hour and 45 minutes. There were hands up from beginning to the end. I had to stop and remind everybody to stop having such a good time because this is supposed to be work. But nonetheless, we went after it. And I would say that by all means, the folks in our group said, let's avoid the scenario. Let's avoid it. Courts, we heard, can really wreak havoc with somewhat creative and overreaching rulings that they make or mandates that they can issue. That bad actors, the folks that we're really trying to actually stop, they'll ignore the new laws just like they ignored the old laws. So who ends up following the new laws and regs? Well, good actors and law-abiding corporations and citizens who simply have greater burdens to bear while the bad actors continue unabated. I'd say that there are huge barriers to entry which really restrains competition if we end up with a very high bar before a website is even able to reach customers, before a website can take credit cards online or allow users, if they've got to certify themselves, it's going to reduce competition. There was a general observation that governments lack the competency to manage something as complex as the net, and that this could actually widen the digital divide if it becomes a challenge for, for certain minorities or disadvantaged people to be able to get those licenses and get the certification necessary to be the publisher or a user on the internet. Another set of uh, reactions this morning was a little bit of an uneasy feeling in the room that this scenario, which is entirely hypothetical, it seemed a little bit too plausible. It's like uh, it, that time may be closer than we think. Namely, that uh, there was an observation that we, we already don't have anonymity on the web. Uh, I was surprised to hear that. The notion that this is already happening in some internet islands, certain nations and regimes, and there's another scenario on islands that will go into that. That the digital divide is also a driver behind the desire to have governments take more control, particularly from le lesser developed countries. And finally, that um, the notion of preserving my career or an organization preserving its purpose in life, particularly from legacy telecom ministries and regulation, that's also a driver, that those folks want something to work on, as the internet has taken over so much of what their old portfolio was. That's the uh, reactions. And now I wanted to cover just a final slide, which is what were our ideas or advice to the various internet government institutions to avoid having this scenario play out. And we thought it was important to try to conclude with concrete advice, because as Yogi Berra said, if, if you don't know where you're going, you, you could wind up somewhere else. Industry, number one imperative coming out of our group was advice and appeal to industry to get busy with innovation, with investment, 
with uh, supporting a multi-stakeholder model because it's really up to us in industry to solve these problems. Can spam didn't stop spam. Industry did. Follow the model, get busy, and support and participate. Industry's got to be taking a lead. Governments, we had two pieces of advice. Please, we said, enforce your existing laws before you focus on brand new ones. And we asked government to, to look at the, at the landscape of solutions as a multiple, multiple set of solutions. The NSB issue, right? No silver bullet. Governments are quick to say this is going to solve the whole problem, and it's always a multifaceted solution. We also didn't want governments to overreact. With ICANN, we had some concrete advice for ICANN, which was to please try to get more governments to participate in the GAC, the Government Advisory Committee, and higher level people from the governments that do participate, higher level people with the technical competence and expertise to understand the complexity of the problems. Then we have, finally, the IGF, what we're really here to talk so much about, the Internet Governance Forum. We came up with three pieces of advice. Keep talking, keep meeting, and uh, focus, as you have at the IGF, as we have at the IGF, on helping lesser developed countries with capacity building. Second was to, within the IGF and even at the regional IGFs, gather and convene people that are technically competent and solution focused and continue to talk about the ways to drive solutions forward. Now, that's actually offered as a sort of counterpoint to the very final piece of advice, which was, look, we need to realize that governments and some uh, intergovernmental organizations are are always going to want to run something like the internet. Just get over it. We actually transitioned ICANN to independence, and that still hasn't been enough for a lot of governments, because what they really want to do is have a far greater role than the one that we envision today. So I, I know Marcus Coomer, in, a, in that Swiss diplomatic way, tried to couch it this way. But I, I really think the translation of that last imperative to, the, to all of us and the work we do at the IGF is to get used to the fact that governments are going to do that. And uh, let's just get over it, and let's get busy on the things that we can change.